Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the seventh annual William J. O'Brien Distinguished Lecture Event. My name is Paul Heffernan. I'm Vice President of Consumer Experiences at New Balance Athletic Shoes, the proud recipient of the third lecture series and a presenting sponsor of this insightful event. What's most interesting about me obtaining the honor of opening tonight's event is that I'm a Worcester boy, one in Manhattan, which as you will find out later, makes me uniquely qualified in presenting tonight's outstanding company, Harpoon Brewery. Before I speak specifically to the qualities and accomplishments of tonight's selection, I want to remind everyone of our lecture series genesis, the late William J. O'Brien, CEO of Hanover Insurance. Bill, as he was called by his friends, was not only an accomplished global businessman, but a pioneer on the values of an organization and how those values contribute to a company's success from both a financial standpoint, but more importantly, a cultural one. Bill was a good guy, and it was with this legacy that I segue into tonight's discussion with New England's largest craft brewer, Harpoon Brewery, and its co-founders, Rich Doyle and Dan Canary. After having been classmates at an unknown four-year school outside of Boston named Harvard, Rich and Dan traveled to Europe to find themselves. During their excursion, they purposely toured many of Europe's finest breweries having had plenty of experience with drinking beer during their rigorous days at Harvard. It was with, it was with this first-hand experience that they solidified their common distaste for the lack of local, fresh, tasteful beer brewed in the United States. During Rich's days at HBS, he documented a practical paper on the subject that would become the impetus for the early stages of our Poon's business development. In 1986, Rich and Dan formally undertook the task and fun of creating Harpoon Brewery. Like any new venture, the early days revealed some quirky habits that helped define a small company's core values. One of these quirks was that Harpoon Associates never bought pens. And it was quickly discovered by vendors and customers that knew it wasn't a Harpoon meeting if the visiting team didn't rifle all the pens that they could find in sight be re before returning back to the brewery. When Rich and Dan told me this story, it harkened back to my early days at New Balance where we didn't buy paper clips. We routinely took them off all incoming mail, pocketed all we could when out of the building, and to this day, I still am programmed to take paper clips off all my junk mail before throwing it out, especially the, the big metal clips. I really like those. <laughs> but I think this simple yet significant practice initiated the concept of values and what, the, what they meant to a company's culture. Whether it was being frugal, thrifty, or mischievous, it sparked other core values that have become the hallmark of Harpoon Brewery. What a customer considers today before and or after they purchase a consumer product is mind-boggling. From price to value to selection, they all have an important role. But it's what Harpoon does as an innate part of their DNA which creates a community and a richness of a real, true brand. Harpoon, led by Rich and Dan's efforts, have always had a sense of not only doing well, but doing good. Whether it's their popular Five Miler in downtown Boston, Harpoon's Point to Point event, their food bank program in Vermont, or sending over 700 associates during the holidays to volunteer for the less fortunate. Harpoon gets what it takes to establish a sustainable brand, be a good neighbor, and a great business entity. Between the quantitative values of continuous improvement to the qualitative grassroots effort, Harpoon reeks with a sense of passion that is reinvented every time they offer a seasonal brew. As my fellow Worcester family and personal friend Dan Canary said, we're in business today for the same reason we got started, to make great beer, to have a brewery that our customers love to visit. Please join me in welcoming the passion behind New England's largest crafted brewer, Rich Doyle and Dan Canary. Thanks, Paul. I have one more responsibility before I sit down, and that is to announce the backbone of the William J. O'Brien Lecture event, our discussion moderator for all seven events, Peter Senge. Peter's distinguished author, an MIT lecturer, and the smartest guy I've ever been in the presence of. The William J. O'Brien Lecture Series is forever indebted to Peter for his contributions. The floor is yours, Peter. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so welcome, everyone. These have been uh, very special events for uh, all of us. I bet there's a few people in the room who've been at all seven. I can recognize a few faces I would nominate. 
as the hardcore. Um, but we're here in part, uh, really I get to say it's kind of a two aspects to it. it it's a great way for us to uh, keep referring back to all the things we learned from Bill. And I don't want to make too big a deal out of this, but I want to make just enough of a big deal out of it, since that is really why we're here. Uh, Bill was a, a master practitioner as a manager. He embodied skills and understanding that was a tremendous source of learning for all of us. Um, it then became very natural to kind of identify contemporary practitioners. Uh, the art of management is like the art of conversation. It's a phrase we all recognize, but it's relatively rare commodity. People are out there managing, but they're not too artful at it. Just like we spend a lot of time talking, but you could say the art of conversation is more or less dwindled as a real vibrant practice today. When it's there, it makes a huge difference. When people manage from the standpoint of growing people and growing an enterprise, and the two are virtually inseparable, um, you get pretty interesting enterprises and a lot of growth for the individuals. Bill used to often frame this by saying, there's really only a couple aspects of our life that are fundamental to how we grow as a person, our families, and he'd say the one that's often neglected is our work. So we may have our family, our community, or church organizations, or other contexts like that. He said, but why wouldn't work be one of the most important aspects of how we grow and develop as people. We spend a lot of time there, right? Uh, we actually uh, do things. They could actually have meaning. <laughs> they could be fun. And they could have an impact on how we grow and develop as people. You might say that was like Bill's fundamental premise. So it's been a great pleasure in this series to find uh, the continual new incarnations of that spirit. Uh, so I want to shut up in a minute and let Rich and Dan tell a little bit of their story. The, the plan for this evening is really simple. Uh, what we've done every time is we've just tried to kind of step into the shoes or look over the shoulder, whatever the metaphor that works best for you. Of What's the journey been like? How did you go about founding this enterprise? What, what led you to want to do it? Um, but particularly, what is it that uh, as you listen to the basic ideas that this series is all about, values-based enterprise, not the words, but the reality. You know, growing organizations through growing people, not the rhetoric, but the fact of it. Um, and, and really seeing the enterprise as part of a larger community, which I think good enterprises historically have done. Uh, but today we see, you know, such extreme examples of the opposite, where the enterprise or the people in the enterprise think they exist search, you know, purely for their own interests, as opposed to, you know, I often remind people, I many of you don't even know this, you used to have to have a charter in America to establish a business, and your charter had to be renewed. This goes back well over 100 years, and in order for your charter to be renewed, in order to get your charter in the first place, you had to have a, a compelling reason why your business would be of some value to the society, not just the investors, to society. Um, so that kind of reminded everybody that to make a profit is not a right, it's a privilege. It's a ra quite a radical idea today, where most people think it's just a, a God-given right. But in fact, our society creates the conditions from our education system to the safety we try to assure in our communities, to the support of all different sorts we try to provide so that businesses and customers can find each other and work in an orderly and effective way and reward those who do it well. Uh, this is basically the social context within which business functions. Without it, you don't have good businesses. And anyone who doubts that should go to some part of the world where it doesn't exist and see how terribly, terribly difficult it is to have a successful enterprise where there's no rule of law or there's such massive corruption that the really businesses can't operate in any way except by being a, a side product of the corrupt environment. Um, so reciprocally, because business is the beneficiary of our willingness to let people earn a profit, the idea was that businesses should have some commitment to the well-being of their society, hence the idea of a charter. So I just kind of remind us of that because it all sounds rather, rather perhaps uh, idealistic or romantic today, 
But I, I don't think it's romantic at all. I think it's practical. Because what it does is it creates businesses or creates a possibility that businesses would really have a larger sense of purpose. So this is the territory we've been exploring uh, throughout these series. And I will shut up now and invite Rich and Dan in whatever way and order they'd like to to tell a little bit of their story and kind of give us a sense of how this all got started. <clears throat> we heard a little of the facts there, but what was it like and you know, what were some of the, the tough kind of or maybe not so tough choices you made? I mean, was it kind of easy all along or was it something that you really had to kind of, kind of take a deep breath at some point and say, do we really want to do this? Um, I, why don't, I, why don't I, I talk a little bit about some of the, the reasons for founding and maybe if you want to talk about some of the, is the problem, mm -hmm. problems that came up or uh, surprises, good and bad, uh, maybe we can do it that way. Uh, um, y you know, the first reason for, um, uh, well, a as a student, the two courses that most influenced my thinking, one was a real estate course where every day we went in and looked at a piece of property and we had to try to make it better. Uh, we had to improve it, we had to increase value, so I was very much uh, in the mind frame of how do I make something better, how do I make something uh, more valuable, how do you take something and improve it. So that was number one. Number, the other class was an agribusiness class that um, we looked at <clears throat> very tangible things, things I could understand. I mean, one case we looked at was Cape Cod potato chips, which was uh, already had been around a little while, but again, was something I could understand, and, and uh, I had been in the uh, investment banking business beforehand and knew that that was not something um, that I wanted to do more. I wasn't that interested in, in that. Mm -hmm. I, people would talk about um, investment things. They would talk about the front page of the Wall Street Journal, and I was you know, talking about the sports page. I, I didn't, you know, it didn't, uh, so I knew that that wasn't what I wanted to do, but <clears throat> as I took these classes, the influence uh, it had on me was to look at things that I was doing, like going out and drinking beer and saying, you know, why is it that every tap in these bars has the same beer pouring out of it? And that really was the, the, the seed, and I, I don't know whether it was just obvious to Dan and I, or we ever had a, I mean, I think it was obvious, but we ever had a, a discussion like that, but I mean, that's, that was really the founding idea, which is, wait a second, hold on. Here we are in Boston, a city that, after we looked at, you know, buys a lot of, of imported beer. There wasn't any local beer. There's one brewery in New England, and that's, that was the Anheuser-Busch Brewery in New Hampshire. Hmm. One brewery in the whole six states. It's a place that's, New England is, is a, a very local, a very loyal place, likes beer, What's wrong with this picture? And it was, it was kind of looking for value, looking for idea, and also saying, well, if somebody else isn't going to do it, maybe we have to do it. Mm -hmm. And so I think that thought, along with understanding from having seen it abroad, the value, the link that local communities can have with a local brewery, and that it becomes part of the, the, the car, car, part of the social culture of that community and the pride of that community, those were the two things that we wanted to bring to, to, to New England. And I think that's, that's why we're in business, the same mm. reason we're in business today. Mm. And I think as Rich alluded to, you know, we had traveled to Europe, been fortunate enough to do that. And one of the things as Americans back 30 years ago um, is it was so eye-opening as a beer drinker because <laughs> you would go to these little towns in Great Britain, for example, and there'd be a local beer, or yeah. several local beers of yeah. all different colors, shapes, yeah. sizes, and flavors, and it was like, wow, it was, I can't, why can't we have this at home? And it was just, well, that's because we just don't, because the big guys dominate the market, and, and that certainly resonated with me, and then coming home and starting to see things like some of the upscale coffee places, the ice cream market kind of be mm -hmm. going upscale and more boutique-y, and um, in the mid 80s were a great time where people started businesses and, and started to see some of those heavier, more expensive products, local products take off with the mass, there was a rejection at some level of the mass market. And so, you know, when Rich came to me, I was in banking at the time and um, said, hey, I put together this research project at, at business school and look at what some guys are doing out in the Pacific Northwest, it uh -huh. certainly fell on fertile ground for me, not only because it harkened back to the, my time in Europe with this like, wow, why can't we have this right. here? But also I was very excited to get away from corporate life um, 
I was immature. I know my father still doesn't understand why I left that good banking job. <laughs> but um, I, uh, I, I didn't have the patience and maturity to really deal with the corporate world as I saw it. And, uh, and believe me, I don't have any regrets. Yeah, yeah. So there's kind of two, th two things I hear in this. One, obviously, is beer. And, 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 and there's something there, and the other is, is something about style and culture and the kind of organization you want to be part of. Um, the first speaker in this series was Rich Tierlink. Uh, Rich is the CEO, or was at that time, the CEO of Harley-Davidson. And having gotten to work around Harley-Davidson for a long time, I have to say I never met a person, man or woman, who didn't ride who didn't ride a bike. And I always thought that was kind of the key to the business in some sense. They loved their product. And it, it's really hard to love a derivative, right? <laughs> it's really hard to love a financial instrument. Uh, but there's something that, exactly, right? Know. There probably are some people <laughs> out there. My kids are in college, so. Yeah, well, okay. <laughs> so it doesn't mean you don't like what it does for you, but it's different than, you uh, mm -hmm. know, having this kind of relationship with the, the essence of the product. I say, you hang around yeah. Harley, and you really get that. It's just, it's in the, it's in the blood. And people talk about bikes, they love bikes, they all ride. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and, and so there's something there that's, that's pretty important. And I'm curious, first off, I'm assuming that, that makes pretty good sense to you guys, both like beer a lot. Um, what, what does that mean in terms of the kind of people who, like, who, who work in a place like Harpoon? And because I know, for you, because we chatted a little bit beforehand, and it doesn't surprise me in the least, one of the number one matters in your mind always is how to get the right people in, and if the mm -hmm. people are not quite right, how to help them out the door. Um, but there's something about a relationship with a product that's pretty important for that. It's not just a job. Yeah, it's very important. I mean, I, I, um, I mean something I've done um, for a long time, uh, I, I handle the sales and marketing side of the business, and Dan handles the finance and operations side of the business, although we, we work together very closely. Um, I, I've always, in interviewing, and I, I always interview, at, at, at certainly in the, in the final interview, all the people who get hired in sales and marketing, I always kind of wait and wait for there to be a, a, a calm, kind of uh, relaxed tone in the, in the interview, and then ask them what's their most um, memorable beer drinking experience. And if they don't have a good one, they're not going to get hired. They don't know that that's the most important question in the interview. <laughs> and, and, you know, it, 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 it helps to understand uh, if they get it. Mm -hmm. If they get it. I mean, it's also, I talk about beer a little bit, and, I mean, I'll, I'll push on that. But, you know, what's in their fridge and, and uh, you know, see if they at least pass the IQ test of saying something about, good about Harpoon. I mean, they don't, I mean, it's like, it, it, wow. It, it really, happens that they don't. No, I know, that's <laughs> what I mean. Miller, that's what Miller I mean. It's, yeah. it's kind of easy yeah. to, those are easy. Yeah. But, um, you know, I think that that is important. And, and I've heard some, fa gotten some fascinating responses. So it, it is, I mean, interviewing that, that as a piece of the culture is critical. Yeah, I'd say it's absolutely critical. And, uh, you know, we haven't just hired, wow, this person sold, uh, Telephone services really well, so they're right. great for us. Mm -hmm. They're right. born salesmen. Right. Yeah. You know, I'd rather have somebody who's a cultural fit who can also be a functional fit, but you can train them on that. Right. But you, you yeah. gotta have you gotta have the beer culture. You gotta love the product, and you gotta love being part of it, or it's not gonna work. Yeah. There's a building on the derivatives theme. You know, one thing I love about our business is that for a relatively small business, you know, we have a lot going on. We have a raw material, an agricultural product coming in the front door, through brewing, packaging, et cetera. We have a finished consumer good. We have a sales marketing function. We've really got all the facets of much larger companies. We're not a one, you know, one trick show. And um, getting, you know, what Rich said, so you, when you're in the parking lot, and I know when the east wind is blowing because I can smell the, the brew house. And if I, to this day, I just breathe deeply and I absolutely love it. <laughs> and other employees comment on that. Oh, it's an east wind. Look, you can smell, you can smell the brew. I wonder what we're brewing today. But our motto is love beer, love life, which is on all of our packaging. I think as Rich mentioned, and it's, he's absolutely spot on about that question in the interview, because I think one of the reasons, you know, our friendship developed and was maintained is because we had some very memorable nights together in college. And 
beer was the halo effect. You know, it <laughs> was... And I, I think people either get that or they don't. And you don't. thought after a while it ought to be good beer. It ought to be good beer. <laughs> but people get that or they don't, and I'm not looking at the general public to all become right. you know, craft beer nuts like we might be. But yeah. we, love beer, love life means something about the sociability of our product and what it means to make a wonderful beer that can bring people together. Um, and so when we're hiring and evaluating people, they either get that or they don't get it, but it's essential to who we are. Yeah. It must be a little bit of a challenge to escape the fraternity image in all that. Uh, I'll tell you why I say that. Um, I, I had a similar history of you uh, as you. I lived in Europe for a while when I was a college student. And I came back to the wasteland of American beer. <laughs> it was really tough. I mean, those of you who aren't beer drinkers, you won't empathize. I appreciate that. That's okay. <laughs> but you can imagine something you really enjoy. And it was a social phenomenon. Because you had a little... I lived in, in Austria. You had the local Gasthaus, and the families were there. Everybody was there. It wasn't the frat house right, kind of right. image. It was a very social image. And people would just, that's where they would go in the evenings. They would just go to the local Gasthaus, and they'd play cards, and they'd just do what human beings have always done, you know, with, they'd just be with each other. And, and it was not, uh, uh, you know, it was a little different kind of cultural ambiance than the frat house one. You must have to deal with that a little, because... The Frat House Association mm -hmm. is one that's kind of extreme. I don't, I don't know exactly what you mean by that. Well, uh, what I mean is that a bunch of guys drinking too much, I mean, today particularly. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a, it's, a, it's a big, I mean, I, as someone who's around universities, it's a big issue. Right. You know, um, and of course, it's not just guys, but that's, of course, the imagery of it. Um, but th that would, because what I was hearing and what you were saying was there was something about the social context. Right. The, the kind of way people relax and are together mm -hmm. that your product symbolizes, which is very different than binge drinking. Completely. And, um, and I, just to yeah, go ahead. jump in, I, I, a, a larger topic that we're not going to get into here is I, I think as a country we do a terrible job of teaching our children how yes. to drink responsibly. Yes. That's a, yeah. But no one cringes more, I don't think, than those in the industry when our products are used irresponsibly. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, the frat house culture, and that I, I think is a tone that we have set as far as not having that at our company. Mm -hmm. Because you're, you're right in the sense it can be a rah, rah, oh, drink, drink, and that's not at all what we've ever been about. It's about quality, not quantity. With really most craft beers, our prices reflect that. The flavor right. of the beer reflects that. Um, we are really about, you know, enjoy this in a social setting responsibly. And, We've certainly had times in the past when you know folks will come in and they might be too rah rah, not understand that we have to be models, if you will, mm -hmm. for the responsible consumption mm -hmm. of our products. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I guess there are two things. I guess what I was asking about was uh, one element is what we do as a company internally with each other. The other is what we do when we're serving the patrons, when we're mm -hmm. serving the public. Mm -hmm. So I didn't know which way you meant. I think Dan maybe spoke to the former. I think I'll speak to the latter a little bit. You know, we run, we just had 16, 17,000 people at our brewery last weekend uh, for Oktoberfest. So up on Friday and Saturday. And so we are aware, we're very familiar with 23 years worth of serving the general public and in, you know, large quantities of beer to large quantities of people. And, you know, I think the way we've approached that is, well, first, um, we're there. We're there at every event. I mean, we we yes. walk through the crowd, and we and we used to. Uh, I mean, we still do. I mean, stand at the gate and watch people leave at the end of the night. And what we would always do is we would um, either say, "Yep, you know, we're we're comfortable with being responsible for the way people are leaving this event," mm -hmm. or "No, we're not." Mm -hmm. And so what we've done is make changes in in the, in that case. And what we do is we'll increase prices and we'll cut the hours of the event. So, mm. you know, the event used to, the Saturday night event used to go it's to 11 o'clock, but now it goes to 9 o'clock. Mm. So, again, we have 12,400 people there on Saturday. It's not like it's not fun. <laughs> but we have to be responsible as yeah. a business, but we're also responsible for, uh, you know, people that might be affected by this and say, well, this is good. This has been fun and this is good. It's not we're going to get an extra two or three hours of pouring time out of our license tonight. Because it really, all of a sudden, then it just doesn't make us feel good. You kind of watch it and you go, oof. Right. There's a, you know, so I think being responsible as a company 
Um, that's, that's one thing internally and setting the tone. And, and I think being responsible as a pourer, as a server, is, is something else. I mean, that certainly has legal ramifications, right. but it has kind of moral implications as well. Sure. You, you really want to say, like, okay, no, I can sign. I'm, and one of the reasons we've been able to do that for 23 years is we haven't, you know, knock on wood, and God willing, we haven't had a problem. Um, but I think it takes a lot of focus and responsibility. And, and I think, you know, when you think about the differences of the culture that you brought up, I think having local breweries being the people who are serving the beer it's makes a big difference. Huge. Because sure. when you have a, uh, you know, now multinational companies who market by um, the TV advertising and that's it, it's like, okay, what are we going to do to get these? You know, we don't know these people. We don't know where this is going. We're going to send our beer out to bars and get them excited about whatever our promotion is. And, and we're, prob and we're probably not going to encourage the bars to close two hours earlier. Right. And so it's about, it's about their public companies and, yep. and they need to have quarterly earnings. And, you know, it's a different kind of feel than say, this is my community. This, yeah. These people are coming out of my event, our event, our company's event and going into the city. And this is our reputation um, on the line going out. And so it's a very risky thing. I mean, what person in their right mind would have an event that has 12,000 people walking out of it having drunk for a few hours? Well, we do it. And I mean, I, I don't, you know, nobody else seems to. I mean, mm -hmm. people don't do it. That's there isn't a lot of this stuff going on. And, yeah. um, and it's difficult to do, but it's very much a cultural thing for our company. It's not sort of like, well, here's, here's this business and how are we going to get more money out of it and how we... You know, it's, it's, it's not like we don't run it as a business, but it's also not run purely as a business. I think that's a little bit of, that, a little bit of what you were talking about, about the local element of it. And I think yeah. alcohol, beer consumption, and beer serving is best done in that local environment. The beer's going to be better. Yeah. Uh, you're more responsible to people. And so the more local breweries, you know, in that sense, the better. Um, because I think, I think all of that, all that beer culture is, is handled in a much better way. It's, it's, a, it's a much better articulation than, than what I was offering in, in the question. I think that really, really kind of paints a, a, a very interesting picture. Um, I was also interested in watching you guys respond. Uh, this is the first time we've done one of these sessions with two co-founders. Um, and I thought it might be fun a little bit to think a little bit about well, what's the, 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 the <coughs> dynamics or the, the rhythms of your partnership. I mean, you've been together a long time. Um, uh, many people here would know this, but not many would know it uh, who, if they didn't know Bill for a long time. Bill had a partnership like that uh, with his uh, former boss, the CEO of, of Hanover, a man named Jack Adam. Uh, Bill was vice president. Uh, and he was CEO for, I don't know, 12, 15 years, a long time. And then Jack retired, and, and Bill invited him to take an office next door. And for the next 10 years or so, Jack was still around. He had no formal role, and he didn't meddle. I mean, he was a smart manager. He knew when he retired, he'd retired. He wasn't there to meddle around. But, but that partnership was very important. And I watched the way that they, they both grew and learned from each other and thought to myself, hmm, one of the reasons that company was so successful, at, at the top, they had two people modeling a quality of partnering. They were very different. They, they kind of had, they could, didn't mean they agreed on everything, but there was something in their partnership. You kind of think of, wait, well, what's a company? But a lot of relationships at some level. So you want some visible evidence of productive relationships. I'm just curious if you guys ever think much about this. Probably you've lived with it for so mm -hmm. long, it's probably pretty implicit for you now. But a lot of companies don't have that. And it, you, excuse me, you get the opposite. You get somebody at the top with too much power and nobody can go up to that person and say, hey, do you realize what the consequence of that decision you just made was? What you don't see, that blindness at the top, is to me is the, is, the is the consequence of not having good partnerships where people can, in fact, call each other on the things that none of us are perfect. We make mistakes, mm -hmm. we have blind spots. I think, you know, I think it's, it's one basic thing is that um, being part of an organization as opposed to being a sole practitioner, um, is it, it, it based on the belief that you can do more uh, with people than by yourself. I, I mean, that's, that's, 
otherwise, why would right. I do it? You know, like, otherwise, people are dragging me down. That's right. If I was only get rid of these people, then you know, be better off. In a sense, so, organizations exist to do together what you could never do by, by yourself. yourself. Right. So I think the first and foremost thing,